an honor and a privilege, and it's always a joy to come to Houston, Missouri, and to be in this church. And uh, we've known Pastor Bill in June for a long, long time. I was just uh, saying, I remember very distinctly the very first time we had the uh, privilege and, the, and, the, and the, really the joy of meeting them. We were at a ministerial association meeting in Harrison, Arkansas, I believe it was, and, and they came in. I think Caitlin was in a pumpkin seat at that time, so just to give you a little idea of how long ago that was. And my wife and I at that time, we've been married, it'll be 31 years uh, coming up in June the 15th, and we didn't have children at that time, but it, was, it wasn't too long after uh, uh, we had married that we, we first met Pastor Bill in June, and they're precious people, your precious church. And every time I come, uh, I see the, the progress uh, that, that the Lord is, is helping you to make here in this community and uh, in this church congregation. It's always a joy. It's a great honor to see what's going on here, to see the young people up here worshiping the Lord and to see that this is a, a multi-generational church. How many of you know that that's an important thing in this day and age? We go to a lot of churches and you see a whole lot more uh, gray hair or less hair. Or, uh, and and uh, I'll tell you what, it's exciting to see a church that's able to reach out to the younger generation and yet at the same time maintain uh, uh, the importance of, of those who, who have some seasoning in their lives and those who have some maturity. And it's great to see the, the mix of those two together. And that's, that's something we have in our heart for our church where we are at in Quebec as well, to see a multicultural and a multi-generational church because we have many cultures represented in our church as well. And so um, I had to slip out just for a moment because I realized I had given the wrong uh, PowerPoint uh, to the folks in the back. I'm hoping that you found the right one that said Houston, Missouri, on it. Yeah, that's it. That's, that's, I know that's the right one. And so um, uh, it's great. I'm going to just take a couple minutes and share with you a couple great reports of what the Lord is doing in the French-speaking world, uh, because you are actually having a big, a big uh, part to, to play in what the Lord is doing. I was talking, talking to Pastor Bill just prior to the service, and I, I shared with him that you know, we've been, as it was already mentioned, on the mission field full-time since 1992. We left the United States in 92 and moved to France. At that time, we just had one child who was uh, 18 months old. Uh, since then, we've had four other children. Our, this is our last-born, Lauren, who's 16. Uh, here, we also have four other sons and one daughter-in-law who's a French-Canadian, doesn't speak English at this point. But... Um, We've been on the mission field full-time since 92, and this church here in Houston, Missouri, uh, has the uh, distinct honor, I guess I would like to believe you would believe it to be an honor, of being the longest uh, supporting church that's been supporting this ministry. There's no other church that's been supporting our ministry longer than you have, and so uh, we are so grateful for that. Uh, I cannot tell you how grateful we are, because we couldn't do what we're doing without the prayers and the support of people like you. And the Lord is doing great things. My wife and I are both from Missouri. Those of you who don't uh, remember meeting us in the past, uh, my wife grew up in southeast Missouri, a little town of Bertrand, uh, 687 people between Sykeston and Charleston. I grew up in St. Louis County. Uh, we met when we were 17 years old and uh, got married. Uh, as a matter of fact, we graduated from high school in May, got married in June, moved to Tulsa, Oklahoma in July, went to Bible school, and, and uh, we haven't really slowed down since, to tell you the truth. And so the Lord supernaturally spoke to our hearts while we were in Bible school. Second year, uh, put a mandate in my heart to begin learning the French language. So my wife bought me a French New Testament on cassette tape, started with the help of the Holy Spirit, learning the language. Uh, we traveled full-time for five years after getting out of school, but we started doing short-term missions trips, especially into France, Belgium, and, and some of the French-speaking areas. And uh, while we were there, as a matter of fact, in France, prior to moving, we felt like the Lord put a, a vision in our heart, dropped down in our spirit, a vision for the nations of the French-speaking world. There are 52 nations in the world that speak French and um, 30 some odd nations in Africa that are French speaking. And what we sensed the Lord speaking to our hearts because he had already spoken to us about Quebec, Canada, six tenths of 1% evangelical believers in the province of, of Quebec, which is French speaking. And he spoke to our hearts uh, one day while we were in the south of France, 
that we were to have a ministry based in Quebec from which we would be able to touch the nations of the French-speaking world. And at that point in time, it was just a dream. It was just a vision. We had nothing uh, uh, in the natural that uh, guaranteed that that could happen. We had no clue of how that could even come to pass. We didn't know anyone when the Lord... I was vacuuming the carpet in St. Louis, Missouri, praying in other tongues, just worshiping the Lord when the Lord spoke to me about Quebec. And we didn't know anyone there, never been there. It was a supernatural thing. We were just two kids from Missouri, and how in the world could anything like that happen? We really didn't know. Uh, But the Lord is good. He's faithful, and if he calls you to do it, faithful is he who calls you, and he will do it, and he gets all the glory. Amen? And so if you're sitting here today and the Lord's put a vision in your heart, and we're going to talk to you about that this morning in the scriptures, we're going to see some of the things that that we need to take a hold of in order to fulfill the purpose and plan of God for our lives. But uh, I want you to know that no matter what God's called you to do, if if God's in it, you can do it. Amen. And we've seen uh, those things which the Lord put in our heart many, many years ago come to pass. And... um, a couple pictures I'm going to show you. I think I'm not sure what the next one is. I think it may just be the, yeah, here's our, our beautiful family. Uh, my wife of 30 plus years, uh, right, Tanya, who's here with me today. We have our firstborn here on the left, Andrew. He is 25, living in Montreal, going to school right now. Uh, we've got our second born, Michael, who's our miracle baby. The doctor said on a couple occasions that he was dead in the womb, but he is alive and well. Married to this beautiful young lady, Nina, who's a French speaking Canadian. Uh, And uh, then we have Zachary. He's on the far right. He's our 20-year-old son. He's actually in Tulsa, Oklahoma right now doing an internship, a video internship with uh, Willie George Ministries, and that's going very well. Then we have our fourth son uh, right here, John. He's uh, 19 years old already. Well, just he will be soon. And then we have uh, Lauren, who's 16. So that's our family. And we appreciate your prayers. Next picture, I think we've got. Yeah, this is one of the things I wanted to share with you. You know, when we uh, had this vision for Quebec, one of the things that came into my spirit during a time of worship in 1990 at a, at a winter Bible seminar in Tulsa, Oklahoma, just worshiping the Lord. There's about 3,000 people there. And the Lord had just several months prior put in our heart about Quebec. We didn't know exactly why or what, but during that time of worship, it came into my spirit that we needed to have a Rama Bible Training Center in Quebec. And at that time, they weren't doing international schools around the world like they are today. So I didn't know how in the world that could come to pass. But 17 years later, it came to pass. We were able, along with uh, our friends in France, John and Laura Madden, launch uh, in parallel the first French-speaking campuses uh, of Rama Bible Training Center in France and in Quebec. And uh, it's, it's been amazing what the Lord has done already. We've, we've had people from all over the province come to school. We've had at least seven or eight other French-speaking nations uh, come and study uh, the Word of God right there. As a matter of fact, just yesterday, we had about 50 people in Drummondville, Quebec, from all over the province that were studying and having a course on, on Christ the Healer. And so, just want, again, God is good, and if He tells you you can do something, you can do it. And so our goal is we started with the schools in France and in in Drummondville, Quebec. We've since then, we added two other campuses in in Quebec. Uh, There's a campus in Geneva, Switzerland now. They just opened in Paris, France. Our friends uh, uh, opened a campus in Paris. We opened in 2012. And in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, with 320 students, uh, and we just had a graduation for all those guys, and we just took in a new intake of 349 students from all over the nation of Haiti. These guys are almost all pastors that have been pastoring for many years, never had any ministerial training, and God's doing amazing things. And so just the next picture real quickly, uh, this is the map of the French-speaking world. You can see all those places in White, those, those are the nations where eventually we believe the Lord is going to help us and the team that the Lord's helping us raise up to, to plant Raymond Bible training centers in those nations and also uh, to see churches planted. And we just want to be uh, available to let God do what he wants to do. Amen. And so I think we've got a couple other pictures that before we get into the word this morning that we can share. Yeah, those are the places where we have the campuses. We can go ahead and flip through those. Uh, one more picture there. That's, those are some of the students we have in Drummondville, Quebec. We can go to the next. Uh, that's another picture from the Quebec campus. Next picture. Here's a, something exciting that's happened. Um, I just was in Kenya, and I believe Pastor Bill was in Kenya just right before I was. What month were you there? In November, I, I was uh, 
it, there in January. And um, anyway, long story short, the the director of Rama Kenya invited me to come. He had it in my heart. Uh, for one of the main reasons I was there was to meet with some uh, leaders from the Congo, which is French-speaking Africa. But while I was there, I taught in the, uh, the school. And also, we had an opportunity to minister to some of these guys that you see here. These are our military police chaplain who are working with the Kenyan uh, uh, defense forces and, and especially those who are, are patrolling the border with Somalia. So these are the guys that are under constant threat of El Shabaab. As a matter of fact, a few days before this picture was taken while we were in country, I don't know if you heard about it, but there were some of the Al-Shabaab terrorists got a hold of um, armored vehicle from Burundi and, and uniforms from Burundi, got through the checkpoints into one of the uh, uh, training camps and uh, under disguise and, and then opened fire and killed about 80 of their guys. And these are the men that are ministering to these, uh, m- these soldiers that are on the front lines protecting uh, the Kenyan border. And they're under an incredible amount of stress and, and strain, but we were able to go in there, teach them the Word of God for five days. Uh, they all got filled with the Holy Ghost and were speaking in other tongues before we left. And as a matter of fact, there's very uh, serious talk about the possibility of, of doing some more things long term of giving them ministerial training, not just for these guys. There's a group of about 100 chaplains. And so that's exciting. And uh, just to let you know that those are some of the things that are happening, and uh, your prayers, your support are making all this happen. And uh, just right before we get into the Word, we're going to show you a real quick video clip. I believe there's one other picture here uh, before the video. Well, there's some of the other guys. Another picture. What's the next one? Uh, this, this is them getting filled with the Holy Spirit right here and speaking in other tongues. It was a, mu- a wonderful day. Next picture, I think, is, the, is this is the first graduating class of Rama Haiti. And so I'm going to show you a clip real quick that my son, who's in Tulsa right now doing the video internship, put together of Haiti. And uh, it's actually from a couple years ago. But just to give you a picture of what your prayers and support are helping to accomplish, and then we'll get into the word. Amen. Thank you. 
Hallelujah. Beautiful, beautiful people. We love the people of Haiti. Awesome, awesome people. And I'll tell you what, what's exciting is to see that these guys that we're, we're training, and not just guys, I mean, they're men and women, that, but they are taking the word and they're putting it into practice. I mean, signs, wonders, and miracles. Uh, we had a class on Christ the Healer. One of the guys who's a pastor, the, the day after he had the class, he went back to his church and he, he taught on healing and laid hands on the sick. And, and in one service, he had one guy with a cancerous brain tumor that completely disappeared. Another woman that had uh, breast cancer, that tumor completely disappeared. And I could give you literally hundreds and hundreds of testimonies like that. They're playing planting churches. One, one guy, while he was still, before he graduated, he was a police officer and coming to school. He planted eight churches in the prison system while he was a student, and he's, and he's continuing to plant more. It's absolutely off the charts what God is doing there, and the Lord gets all the glory and all the honor for it, but uh, it's exciting. Amen. How many of you are ready to look into the Word today? Good, good, because I have just some things in my heart that I've been uh, really meditating on in, in recent months and uh, been sharing uh, every opportunity I get over the last uh, few times I've had an opportunity to share with, with churches. I feel like the Lord gave me a, a mandate to share this, this message. And um, as a matter of fact, I was, I was speaking at a conference uh, not too very long ago in February, and as I was seeking the Lord is in regards to His direction on what He wanted me to share, I it was my wife's birthday, and I was just getting ready to leave for Haiti that day, and uh, took her out to breakfast before I had to leave for Haiti, and um, every three months, I'm there for 10 days. As a matter of fact, I'm leaving on, we- on Wednesday, I think. This Wednesday, I'm leaving for Haiti again, and, uh, and I got up from the table just to, to, to go to the washroom, and my, between the table and the washroom, I felt like I had a little spiritual download. The Lord uh, dropped a phrase into my heart. And it's a phrase we use all the time, and we say it all the time, uh, but the words just came up in my spirit, what on earth are you doing, for heaven's sake? And, uh, you know, we say that a lot of times uh, when we're in a situation where someone's doing something that we are not sure why, and we're trying to, or sometimes not always a very positive uh, situation, we say, what on earth are you doing? Uh, But, you know, that came into my spirit, and I began thinking about that, and I thought, that is a really good question for every believer to ask, isn't it? What on the earth are you doing for heaven's sake? And you know, we all are on the earth for just a short period of time. Uh, This life is fleeting, it's passing. Uh, Even though sometimes uh, it might feel long, the reality is, even if someone lives 70, 80, 90, 100, 110, 120 years on the earth, that's really pretty short in light of eternity. How many of you are in agreement? It's here, it's gone, and what do we have to show for it? It's a question that I believe all of us need to ask ourselves regularly. And there's a verse of scripture I'd just like for you to, if you have your Bible, you can turn and you can look with me in Philippians uh, chapter 3, and uh, we're going to start at verse 18. If you don't have your Bible, I believe it's on the screen. And here's what Paul says, and I believe this is pertinent for us today. He says, for I have told you often before, and I say it again with tears in my eyes, that there are many whose conduct shows that they are really enemies of the cross of Christ. You know, and this is important because the way we live, the way we conduct ourselves can, can project a message whether or not we're living for God or actually living as an enemy of the cross. And, and that's a pretty serious deal. I don't ever want to be found in a situation where my life reflects that I'm really living as an enemy of the cross And what are the characteristics of that person? It says they are headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things. And and that's that's something that's pretty easy to understand. We see that all the time. We see people that are are self-centered, that their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things. Our society more and more is is filled with those kind of, uh, of, of situations, people that are doing shameful, sinful acts, and yet for them it's normal, and they're not, they're not at all regretting what they're doing. As a matter of fact, they're proud of it. But there's another, there's another characteristic that's in this verse that I think we need to underline. It says, and they think only about this life here on the earth. And so here, the, the, according to this scripture, those who think only about the life on the earth are, are put in the same category with those whose God is their appetite and those who boast about shameful things. And you know, I don't know about you, 
But I've, I have to be honest with myself. There have been many times I, I gave my life to Jesus when I was just, just before I was 10 years old. I was nine, almost 10 years old. And so I've been a Christian. I'm 49 years old. So for about 40 years now, I've been, I've been a, a believer. And I would like to say that in those 40 years, every day of my Christian life since I gave my life to Jesus, that every day I've been conscious of heaven and that I've thought about heaven or I've thought about eternity or, and that I've had a heavenly mindset. But the truth of the matter is, I can't say that today. The truth of the matter is there have been many days where I've, I've spent 24 hours of my life with not a, and the thought of heaven never even crossed my mind. There have been actually entire weeks that have gone by where I haven't really consciously thought about heaven. There have been months that have gone by that I haven't really had too much conscious thought. I've been so involved and so caught up in my little world here upon the earth that I haven't even been mindful of heaven. And I know that's not true in Houston, Missouri, because you're much more spiritual than, 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 than those of us uh, uh, that live in Quebec, probably. But the fact of the matter is, no, I know that there are a lot of Christians that probably can relate to what I'm saying. Amen? Any of you here can relate to... You can be honest and say, yeah, there have been a lot of days that go by that I'm not really mindful of heaven. I'm not really mindful. And as a matter of fact, I remember back in the 80s, there was a song that was really popular uh, uh, that was on the radio, a Christian song, and that was, if you're too heavenly minded, you'll be no earthly good. How many of you ever heard that song? There was something about that song that always bothered me because I thought, well, you know, if, if, if what you mean by that is if you're thinking about heaven and, and, and thinking about just walking on streets of gold and you're, or you're thinking about floating around on a cloud and playing a harp or something like that all day long, yeah, then you're not going to do much good here upon the earth. Or if you're, if you're thinking about heaven, it means, oh, I can't wait to leave this earth and, and I can't wait to get out of here because I'm just going to hang on as long as I can, suffer through this life and finally get to heaven. If that's what you mean, yeah, you're not going to be much earthly good. But if I look at the scriptures, I see there, there's another mindset that, the, that most men and women of God who are set out in, in, in the scriptures as our examples to follow, most of them had a mindset which, which was very definitely conscious of the fact that this life on the earth is temporary yet important. Amen? If you look at Hebrews 11.10, Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city uh, with eternal foundations, a city designed and built by God. Yeah, that's Abraham. So he was, he was on the earth, but he was thinking about this new city. In verse 16, it says, but they were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. That is why God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Now, that's a powerful verse, isn't it? That is why God is not ashamed to be called their God. The one, the one of the reasons God was not ashamed to be called their God was because they had a heavenly mindset. Can we say it together? A heavenly mindset. In other words, we need to be thinking about heaven some. Amen? We need to be conscious of heaven. And the question, and I put it up here on the PowerPoint that, that I, I want to ask you today is, can we really be too heavenly minded? Is it possible to really be too heavenly minded? I don't think so if we're, if we're truly heavenly minded, if, if our heavenly mindset is, is anchored uh, 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 in scripture, and if our heavenly mindset is tempered by, a, 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 by an understanding and a revelation of who we are in Christ and why we're here upon the earth, as a matter of fact, I believe this. I love what is, is uh, the quote that I have on the board here for you. It says this, if you read history... You will find that the Christians who did most for this present world were precisely those who thought most of the next. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this. And I don't know about you, but for me, that's a big challenge. That's like, wow, you know what? That kind of stirs me up. As a matter of fact, I believe this, that the more conscious you are of heaven, the more fruit you will bear upon the earth. And the more you'll understand how important it is for you to be here on the place, on earth. As a matter of fact, this quote ends with, by, by saying this, aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you will get neither. You know, it goes right along with what Jesus said. Now that's a quote from C.S. Lewis, you know, the author of Narnia. Many of you have seen the movie or read the books, Narnia. He was also a great theologian, uh, wrote uh, Mere Christianity and a lot of interesting uh, 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 theological books. But you know, the thing is this, the thing is this, 
What he's saying here is is not any different than what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6. Seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. What things? The things that the pagans are running after. You know, the the clothing, the houses, the, the material things that we need in this life. Your father knows we need these things. But if you'll aim at heaven, you'll get earth thrown in. But if you aim only at the earth, if you think only of earthly things, you're not going to get either. You'll get neither heaven nor earth. But if you want a really good life, if you want life to make sense, you need to live with a heavenly mindset. Amen? Amen. And so uh, this is exactly what Paul says in the next scripture. It says, if you then were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is seating at the right hand of God. So we need to be seeking after. We need to be earnestly pursuing. As a matter of fact, it says, set your mind on things above, not on the things on the earth. Or you died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. Can we say that together? Set your mind. mind. Okay, another way of saying that is to have a mindset. What kind of a mindset do we need to have in order to have a productive life here on the earth? We need a heavenly mindset. We need to realize that we are passengers, we, we, uh, uh, les passagers, we say in French. We are pilgrims. We are strangers. We are aliens here upon the earth. We're just passing through, but we're, we're here on the earth for a reason and a purpose. As a matter of fact, our purpose on the earth is so t- vitally important. It's so vitally important. Paul revealed his heavenly mindset, and he showed us the the relationship between his earth life and his heaven life here in this verse in Philippians chapter 1. It's again, it's on the screen. I put a lot of these on the PowerPoint just so we can look through a lot of scriptures quickly this morning. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what shall I choose? I cannot tell. For I am hard pressed between the two having a desire to depart and be with Christ. In other words, he had a desire to go to heaven, which is far better. How many of you know that it's going to be a lot better in heaven? I I told my wife and my kids today, I I love coming to southern Missouri, and I love Texas County. Texas County is a beautiful county in Missouri, and and it's just, it's awesome. I love it. Uh, You know, I like places where you have to stop. On the way here, I had to stop and let the turkey cross the road, you know? I mean, I like that. I'm a hunter and stuff, too. So, I mean, this is a great place. How many of you know, you're blessed, you know? You've got nice rivers. You've got great wildlife. It's a beautiful place, but when you think about the reality that what you're seeing, the most beautiful, think about the most beautiful scenery you've ever seen on planet earth, whether it's Texas County or someplace else. What you're seeing is a cursed version. Can you imagine how beautiful heaven is going to be? Can you imagine how awesome it's going to be to be in the very presence of God? It's far better. Paul says that. I have a desire to depart. We should never be afraid to die. We should never be afraid to leave this earth. We need to realize it's going to be a whole lot better. But he says, nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you for your progress and your joy of faith. So what we, what, what we see here is the more conscious you are of heaven. Now, this is really important what I'm going to say. The more conscious you are of heaven, the longer you'll want to stay on the earth. Why? Because you're going to understand that you have a mission to accomplish on the earth. That your earth time is important time. That what you do on the earth is actually going to bear fruit. That's what Paul said. I have the desire. I want to go to heaven. And you can imagine, he's writing this scripture from a prison cell. Can you imagine? It's not hard to understand why Paul would want to leave this earth. He had a lot of interesting uh, experiences. You think about the the afflictions that he went through. In in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and the like, he was shipwrecked. He was naked. He was uh, stoned. He was left for dead he was beaten. He he had all kinds of hardships. And yet he said, it's going to be far better in heaven. And yet I need to stay on the earth a little while longer because it's going to help your faith and it's going to help produce more fruit. And and so this is what we need to understand. A heavenly mindset, the more you, you, you are really in tune with heaven, the longer you will want to stay here upon the earth in order to fulfill God's plans and purposes. Amen. And this is something that came into my heart. I put it on the, on the screen. This is just, uh, uh, I wrote this down when I was meditating on this. And the believers who make the greatest eternal impact are those who respect the spiritual laws that govern the interaction of heaven and earth. And what we need to understand is we're here on the earth for a purpose. 
And I continue by saying this, they understand the profound influence each realm has on the other and they order their lives accordingly. Why is it so important for, why was it important for Paul to stay on the earth? And why is it important for you and for me to stay on the earth as long as we possibly can? Why is that important? It's because we have a mission to accomplish on the earth that only we can accomplish. What do I mean by that? When God created Adam and he put him in the garden, he gave him dominion. He gave him authority. He, he told him to, to, uh, to cultivate the earth and he also told him to guard the garden and he told him to dominate and to have dominion over every creature. And so in other words, God delegated his authority to Adam. Adam in one sense became the God of, of this earth and yet when Adam sinned, he gave his authority over to Satan. And Satan became the god of this world. So all the evil, the wars, the famines, the plagues, the pestilence, the sickness and disease, every every bit of suffering we see on the earth, it's, it's it's not our Lord Jesus. Jesus came to give us life and to give it more abundantly. But the thief, the devil has come to steal, kill, and destroy. And he had a certain amount of authority delegated to him. The first Adam gave it to him. But the good news is the last Adam, Jesus, has come and he has taken that authority and he's taken those keys and he's given it back to the church. Amen. So you and I have the keys. And so there are things that God himself wants to do on the earth that he cannot do unless a believer on the earth takes those keys and uses the authority of Jesus in Jesus name. There are nations he wants to change. There are communities he wants to touch. There are are bodies he he wants to heal. There are many things that the Lord Jesus wants to do. But here's what we have to understand. Jesus, the head of the church in his physical resurrected body, his physical resurrected body is now in heaven. Amen. It's not on the earth anymore. His spiritual body, the church is on the earth. And I love this. When you think about this, the head, okay, physically he's a, right now his resurrected body is seated in heaven, but his spirit, he's, he's here with us. He's in us. He lives in his church. Amen. We, it's the opposite for us believers. It's the opposite. Our physical body is on the earth, but we're seated with him in heavenly places spiritually. Amen. And so what we need is a revelation of the fact that there are things God wants to do on the earth that he cannot and will not do unless someone here on the earth authorizes it. And that's why we need to stay on the earth as long as we can. Look at this verse in Matthew 16, 19. It says, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Verse, chapter 18, verse 19 says, again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth, let's say that together, on earth. on earth. See, once you leave this earth, you can't do this anymore. That's why people who pray to the saints who are departed and talk to people that, and try to a, a, a think that their, their prayers are going to be more effective if they get somebody that's in heaven to pray for them. No, that's not, they're, they're not understanding the, the laws of the spirit that, that are in place. They're not understanding the fact that God gave delegated authority to a man upon the earth. And it's a man on the earth who must do the asking. It's a man on the earth who must do the commanding. When Jesus walked on the earth, he did these things. But now he's given us the keys and it's up to us to go into all the world to preach the gospel, to take authority, and to see the kingdom of God established. Amen? And so, so important. John Wesley said this, it seems that God is limited by our prayer life, that he can do nothing for humanity unless someone asks him. And that someone has to be here on the earth. Amen? Why don't you look at your neighbor and say, I'm so glad you're here on the earth. I'm looking at a lot of verses this morning, but, but we're, we're going to do it quickly. And, and uh, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we see, again, Paul, he's making reference to this heavenly mindset. And he says this, for we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, that we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. I love this because he contrasts a house and a tent. Now, I grew up canoe camping. I mean, I, I love the, the 11 Point River, the Merrimack Current and everything. That's my dad. We, we just grew up canoe camping. So I like to camp and I like tents and I can even sleep under the stars without a tent and that's fine too. But how many of you know that that's really fun for a, a, a few days or, or maybe a week or so, but then it's good to get back to the house and get a real shower, and sleep in a real bed. How many of you know what I'm talking about? And so, you know, camping's good, but the fact is, here, as long as we're here on the earth, we're still camping. Why don't you look at your other neighbor and say, we're still camping. 
We're still camping. We're not home yet. We're not home and we need this mindset. And that's what Paul is saying here. And he goes on, he says, for in this we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. And and in this chapter five, there's a lot of things he says about this heavenly mindset. And uh, he says, for, verse six and seven says, so, so we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord for we walk by faith and not by sight. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well pleasing to him. And so we're here on the earth, we're camping, but we're camping with a mission. Okay, this isn't just uh, camping for fun. This is more like a military bivouac. We're here on a mission, we're in the army, and God has given us a mission to accomplish here upon the earth, and so we need that mindset, because I want to make a difference here on the earth. How about you? We're camping, but we've been given delegated authority. And you know, and here's the thing, when you think about a delegation, you know, God is the ultimate delegator. I I quite frankly find it amazing that Jesus has vested so much trust in his church. I mean, here he comes, he comes, he takes upon the form of a man, he becomes a man, he he suffers, he dies, he's buried, he's resurrected, and then he says, okay, now here are the keys, I want you to finish the job, church, I'm going to help you, I'm going to work with you, but it's up to you to get the mission done. Wow, he's putting a lot of trust in us, He's, he's delegated power to us and and authority and you know what a good delegation actually there's three things there's there's authority there's responsibility and there's accountability and in this chapter five of second corinthians we see all three of those elements and just real quickly and we're going to look at that what on earth here's the, the question we need to ask is what on earth are you doing with your authority that he has given you are you using it for God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself with no, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So you've been authorized to preach the gospel, but are you using those keys? Are we using them? That's a good question for each of us to ask, isn't it? So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ. Let's say it together. We speak for Christ. Let's say that one more time and really think about what we're saying. We speak for Christ. Do you know that's an awesome thing? We have been authorized to speak in the name of the living God of the living of the universe. Amen? And he says, for we we plead, come back to God. So we need to ask ourselves, what are we doing with that authority? What on earth are we doing with the responsibility he's given us? And that's that's the same chapter goes on and says, because we understand our fearful responsibility to the Lord, we work hard to persuade others. God knows we're sincere, and I hope you know this too. Either way, Christ's love controls us since we believe that Christ died for all. We also believe that we have all died to our old life. He died for everyone so that those who receive this new life, and here, look at this, will no longer live for who? Themselves, but instead they will live for Christ who died for them and raised them. So we're talking about a heavenly mindset. What are you doing with your authority? What are you doing with your responsibility? What are you doing with the fact that we're gonna be accountable to him? What on earth are you doing about that? Because here's what that, that same chapter ends with this verse in verse 10. For we must all stand before Christ to be judged. We will each receive what we deserve for the good or the evil we have done in this earthly body. So Here we've got a a picture that's painted, and Paul, we've looked at a lot of scriptures, and we've looked at them quickly this morning, and I I usually don't look at so many scriptures so fast in a message, but I, I felt like it was what we needed to do. But here's the thing. We've been given an opportunity to live a life here upon the earth with a heavenly mindset, realizing that we're in a bivouac, we're camping, we're in this tent, we're here for a certain amount of time, we have a mission to accomplish, we've been given a, a delegated God has delegated to the church the mission. And so we have an authority, we have responsibility, we have accountability. One day, you and I are gonna stand before Jesus and give an account for what we've done here on the earth. And the more we're conscious of heaven, the more we're conscious of what we're doing here, on, it's, gonna, it's gonna make our earth life so much more fruitful and so much more effective, amen? Hallelujah. And so as a matter of fact, Peter says this, therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. Here's the same mindset, okay? Look at your other neighbor and say, arm yourself with this mindset. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin that we no longer should live the rest of this time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God, amen? And so just real quickly, before we we finish here this morning, I just wanna give you a real quick list. You can write them down. 
the verses are on that. We're not, we're not going to have time to, to look, but five things, because I started this message with, with two questions. What on earth are you doing for heaven's sake? What on earth are you doing with your authority? What on earth are you doing with your responsibility? What on earth are you doing about the accountability that, that has been delegated unto you? And here's, a, here's one thing we can say, five things for heaven's sake, for heaven's sake, Five things we can do, each and every one of us. Number one, for heaven's sake, add some fight to your faith because you're here on the earth for a reason. You're here on the earth for a purpose. For heaven's sake, for the sake of heaven, add some fight to your faith. What do I mean by that? I mean, how many of you know that this life on the earth is, is, is filled with, with uh, challenges and filled with opportunities to fight the good fight of faith? The enemy is not prone to just cross his arms and, and, and say, oh, well, too bad, that person got saved, that person's a believer, oh, that person decided to stay with their uh, husband or stay with their wife and to fix their marriage, oh, that person decided to, 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 uh, uh, to make a uh, uh, positive change in their life. He's not just going to sit back and say, oh, too bad. He's going to do everything within his power to stop you. How many of you know that's true? When it comes to your physical health, how many of you know that, that he, would, he would love, the devil would love more than anything else for every one of us in this room to die early? and to leave the earth before it's time. So I'm saying, for heaven's sake, add some faith to your fight. In other words, if your primary motivation for being healed in your body is because you're scared to die, well, you probably better start planning your funeral. But if your primary motivation is, you know what? No, I'm not done with yet. I'm not finished with my mission yet. There's more people to reach. There are more souls to be saved. There are more nations to be changed. That I am going to fight the good fight of faith. Amen. I'll tell you what, I've had lots of challenges in this area. I've had, I, I'm not going to take the time to, to tell you about it today, but I mean, when in my 20s even, they thought I had a brain tumor or, or they, no, it wasn't that. There must be multiple sclerosis. I had all kinds of neurological things going on in my body and I had a 10 year battle, but I had to make a decision. No, I'm going to live because you know what? I've got a wife, I've got five kids and I've got a call on my life and I'm not going to die yet. Amen. And I can give you story after story, and I got victory over that, and I was fine for seven, eight years until I got poisoned in Haiti with a neurotoxin, and uh, then I had all these symptoms and more come back, and I had a three-year battle, but you know what? I decided again, I'm not going to quit, and I've just been, it's about maybe eight months that I'm normal again. Glory to God. <laughs> Hallelujah. But I'm not going to, I'm going to add some fight to my faith. Look at your neighbor and say, add some fight to your faith. Acts 13, 22, you can write it down. I, we'll just read it quickly. I found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart who will do all of my will. And verse 34 says, for David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep. So this is my declaration. I am not gonna fall asleep in death until I have served God's purpose for my generation. Amen? I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. Psalm 118, 17. Amen. So for heaven's sake, add some faith to your fight. Number two, for heaven's sake, add some purpose to your prospering. Add some purpose to your prospering. I believe this. You know, we have a lot of people in the church today who have gotten their priorities wrong and, uh, and they're, 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 anxious to get wealthy. They're anxious to have material means and their needs met, but it's not always for the right reason. I believe God needs the church of Jesus Christ to prosper never the, uh, the, uh, more than ever before. Amen. But there's a reason for it. You know, Ephesians 4.28 says, let him who steals steal no longer, but rather let him labor working with his hands what is good that he may have something to give him who has need. We're, we're working, as the saying says, we're, we're, we're working for a giving, not working for a living. And uh, the more we have that mindset, you know what? There's, a, there's, there's something to be done here on the earth. I need to be wealthy. I need to be uh, blessed because I need to be a blessing to others. I need to help support what the church is doing. I need to be a tither. You know, only 16% of Christians tithe, and that's just... It's Imagine what would happen in, in the world if, if Christians got a revelation of tithing and giving. Uh, you know, add some, add some purpose to your prospering. Number three, add, for heaven's sake, add some perspective to your problems. Add some perspective to your problems. A heavenly mindset will help you add perspective to your problems. Those things which seem so big and so horrible and those big, 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 big problems that you and I have. You know, we laugh. I have five kids, and as, as raising five kids, you, you hear a lot of funny things. And you have a lot of crises, you know, when you have a two-year-old crises or a three-year-old crises, you know. It could be my cookie broke, you know. 
and, and I don't want my cookie broken. Well, here, have another one. No, I don't want another one. I want this one, but I don't want it broken. It's a serious problem, you know, and we laugh. We say, oh, how silly, you know, but, it, but we have real problems like the car payments due or the mortgage is due, and that's a real problem. The, you know, God's got to laugh at our problems as adults just as much as we laugh at our kids' problems, Amen. Add some perspective to it. I read Paul and what he went through, and it's like, you know what? A heavenly mindset will help us get through a lot of these things. As a matter of fact, Paul said this, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, light affliction. What kind of light affliction? Uh, Being stoned, left for dead, being beaten, uh, shipwrecked, uh, you know, uh, betrayed by your friends, left by all of your, uh, your teammates and everything. Just light affliction. I dare say none of us have been so lightly afflicted. Amen is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, amen? While we do not look at the things which are seen, but we look at the things which are not seen. That's our mindset. We're thinking about heaven. For the things which are not are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal, amen? And I think, as a matter of fact, I think I may have put in, in right here, a next picture. What's the next slide? Yeah, I stuck that in there. We already showed you this picture. I thought, you know what? Whenever I start thinking I've got a problem, I think about these guys in Kenya that when, you know, they, they're sleeping in tents, literally on the Somalian border, but they have six foot holes, foxholes in the bottom of their tents so that in case they're attacked in the middle of the night, they can jump in the hole. It's like, yeah, sometimes we need a little perspective. Amen? Amen. And let's look at another thing we can do. Uh, for heaven's sake, number four, for heaven's sake, give some meaning to your mundane. Give some meaning to your mundane. What do I mean by that? There, what I mean is we have an expression in French, metro boulot dodo, metro boulot dodo. And what that means is you take the metro, you go to work and you sleep. You take the metro or the subway, you go to work and you sleep. And it's just routine and it just gets fatiguing and, it, and it's just boring and life is dull. And, and what's the purpose and what's the meaning? I'll tell you what, a heavenly mindset will help give some meaning to your mundane. So even if you're going to the same job day after day after day and you're, you're pulling the same lever or you're pushing the same pencil, you're running the same kind of numbers or, or whatever you're doing, you're, you're working with the same people it's, and it gets root, uh, monotonous and it's a routine, a heavenly mindset will help you understand, no, nope, you know what, there's a reason I'm here and, and I can do this with joy and I can do this with purpose. Uh, my purpose is to be a light to those I'm working with. Number one, I can be an example. I can be a witness. I can win my coworkers to Christ. Number two, I can get a paycheck. I'm gonna take care of my family, but I'm also gonna tithe and I'm gonna give offerings. And so there's, it adds some meaning to your mundane. Amen? And it's, in, it's important to have that kind of a heavenly mindset. Amen? And uh, as a matter of fact, the scripture here says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense to the Jews or Greeks or the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own, but that of many, that they might be saved. Amen? And uh, I've got a picture here real quick. These are some of our students in Haiti. Look at what they've got. They've got name tags with barcodes. And I like, the, I like to use this example just real quickly because... We've got a guy that lives in Germany. He's retired, and uh, he's never, he wasn't a computer uh, guy. He was in some other business. I forget what, but he taught himself how to use a computer, and he has taken it upon himself to create a database, uh, and he has put hours and hours and hours of monotonous, boring work into creating a database, which is now being used by almost all the Raymond Bible Training Centers in Europe, and we are using it for our students in Haiti so we can scan their, and we have their attendance, and we have all their their grades and everything is all computerized. There's no way we'd be able to handle 350 students without his system. So this retired man doing a monotonous, mundane job is actually making a difference for eternity. Amen? So add some meaning to your mundane. And we're just going to end with one more, one more little bit of exhortation, and that is this. For heaven's sake, add some motivation to your mission. Add some motivation to your mission. You know, we, we all know. I don't think there's a believer here that, that's not conscious of the fact that we've been given the great commission. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Amen? But a heavenly mindset will give you a little more motivation for that. As a matter of fact, my wife says this. And she said this right before we were getting ready to make a move. I think it was right before we moved overseas. And we, and there, was some, there was a challenge there. We were leaving our country. We were leaving our family. We, were le- we're, we knew that our kids were going to grow up uh, thousands and thousands of miles be- away from grandparents and aunts and uncles and, and everything else. But my wife had this revelation and we, she wrote this down and she colored it and she put it on our refrigerator. And that was this, 
if we can look at next slide, and this is, this is worth writing down. Life's too short and eternity is too long not to do the will of God. And, and I'll tell you what, that's, it, it, it's motivating to when I realize, no, we're here on the earth for a reason. We're here for a short period of time, but uh, that's the kind of mindset that we, we need to have. In John chapter 9, verse 4 and 5, the last verse is this, for I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. As long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. Let's say this together. As long as I'm on the earth, as long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. And it's that heavenly mindset that's going to change the way you live here on the earth. If we can just stand this, this morning and pray, I would like to just pray with you this morning. Hallelujah. I believe that's the, the word that I was meant to share. I believe that I needed to hear that again. There are certain things we need to hear over and over again. How many of you know what I'm talking about? And uh, I believe that there may be some of you here today that as you've heard this word, it's maybe stirred some things up in your spirit. It stirred you, your heart. Maybe uh, some of you, it might be an opportunity for you to, to just do a little quick adjustment, a quick evaluation. Sometimes, you know what? It doesn't take a, a, a long, long time to make the necessary adjustments in our life to, to go from being unfruitful to fruitful. Sometimes it's just a mindset. It's an attitude. Some of you might be here this morning, and I'd just like to pray with those who might be. If we just close our eyes just for a moment. If there's anybody here this morning who's never given their life to Jesus, I don't ever like to preach the word without giving someone an opportunity to give their heart to Jesus. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus, I'll tell you what. Your life on earth has no purpose or meaning without Christ. For me to live is Christ and die is gain. So I just, I'm just going to, in just a, in a moment, I'm going to count to three. And if you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus, or maybe you have and you've walked away from him, and today you'd like to come back to him, I'd just like to give you an opportunity to pray and to get your heart right with God this morning. And then after that, I just want to say a prayer with the rest of us that are here this morning. That, that We know that we know that we're saved. We know we're children of God. But just a prayer of consecration that we might commit ourselves as never before here on the earth to doing the will of God for heaven's sake. So right before I count to three, one last time, is there someone here within the sound of my voice this morning? And you, if you're honest with yourself and you're honest with God, if you left the building today and your heart stopped beating and your spirit left your body, you're not 100% sure that you would go to heaven. Today, if you're not sure, you can know. It's not something you can earn. By grace, we're saved through faith. And that's not of ourselves. It's the gift of God. If you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So is there anybody here today that's never given their life to Jesus? Or maybe you have in the past, but you've really walked away from him and today you'd like to come back and restore fellowship with him is there anybody just on the count of three raise your hand one two three is there anybody this morning yeah there's someone right here is there anybody else this morning there's another one here in the back you'd like to come back to jesus or give your life to jesus there's another here anybody else just real bold you just have come from what's that pray because i let me have him come down it's good. Pastor, I'm going to have Pastor Bill come and pray with, with you. I know that each church does things a little differently, and I want to respect that. 